This is Barb Cardell. I'm the PWN USA Training Director, and I'm going to go ahead and welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's see, make sure that I've got all my slides up and running. If somebody can drop in the chat box, if you can see the slides, that'd be great. And how is my volume? Is that okay? All right, fantastic. Well, again, thank you all so much for joining us for our PWN block party number four. We have been building our community organizing skills and our mobilizing strength over now four weeks. We have two more left. And uh, by the end, we will have some wonderful new strategies and practices as have been shared by our facilitators, Rika, Lisa, Neve, uh, Queen, and Shannon. So thank you to all of the facilitators who have been part of all of our conversations. So uh, I'm just gonna give a little bit of a background about the US Positive Women's Network. So the US Positive Women's Network is a group led by and for women living with HIV. We started in 2008 when a group of 28 leaders came together determined to control our destiny. We knew that um, as Wahida, who is on our slide here, has always said, no one is coming to save us, so we have better save ourselves. So everything that we work to do is about building our community strength and power and coming together to be able to develop um, what we need to be able to demand uh, the policies and the programs that support women living with HIV, including our trans and gender non-conforming sisters and siblings. So our mission for PWN is to prepare and involve women living with HIV in all of our diversity, in all levels of policy and decision making. We always like to mention that PWN, actually we uh, now include this in every conversation that we have. The PWN sees the HIV epidemic especially as black, brown, LGBTQ, transgender nonconforming, and low-income people are disproportionately impacted, and that this is a symptom of these larger inequities and injustices. We organize to build power in the communities that are most impacted by this epidemic. We did the core strategies, including leadership development, organizing and mobilizing for our strategic campaigns, which are both issues and electoral-based organizing, our policy and, uh, analysis and policy advocacy, as well as our strategic communications. And again, all of this uh, center racial, economic, and gender justice for women living with HIV. We have our priorities that we use to form uh, our, our policy demands and our community organizing. Um, you can read more about them at our PWN USA policy agenda blog. Um, we talk about universal health care and economic justice and sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. We talk about ending criminalization. We talk about supporting trans rights, safety and justice and the violence against women living with HIV. So these are our three key policy platforms, or sorry, our six key policy platforms that we um, use. And you can read more about them there are fact sheets, as well as a greater description of each of these on our website. So what is the PWN USA block party, other than an opportunity for us to come together uh, every other Saturday morning build some skills, get some dancing on, um, and listen to uh, some great uh, We Are Family music first thing on a Saturday morning. The Black Party is a summertime web-based series, and it's designed to build skills um, around grassroots organizing in our community. And it's good to remind ourselves why this is so important. It's because our racial, gender, and economic just injustices hurt all of us. They damage all of us. Um, because as we build power uh, for our communities, it is about listening to people's real concerns so we can address them, not just assuming what we think people need. Because organizing depends on relationships and strength and rigor. And finally, because we are going to be here after 2020, no matter what happens. So we're going to be in our communities. We're going to be trusted sources 
of information as well as um, advocacy within our communities. We want to make sure that we are organized for 2020 and beyond. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today. There are a couple of ways that you can go ahead and participate. As we can already see by our very active chat box, you can go ahead and post something in there. We have a couple of uh, facilitators who are going ahead and keeping an eye on it for us, um, including Kelly from PWN uh, from staff. She is volunteered to help with the chat box as well. Um, you can go ahead and raise your hand. We've got all the panelists, or we've got all the attendees listed. And if you raise your hand, we can go ahead and unmute you. Otherwise, everybody is in uh, mute mode as an attendee so that we can go ahead and get a good recording of this to share on our website so that if people aren't able to join us today, that they can go ahead and um, have access to the information as well. And finally, we feel like uh, talking about what we're doing on Twitter always amplifies our message, shares our excitement. So feel free, if there's something that you think is exciting, go ahead and tweet it out, at USPWN is our Twitter handle, and um, we will go ahead and retweet, and um, we will also go ahead and post the link to the video once it is finished. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa, who is our lead facilitator for today. Hey, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here again. Um, this has been a great summer so far. And I uh, want to welcome you to, as, as Barb um, said, this is our fourth webinar. Um, my name is Lisa Maria Castellanos, so and my pronouns are they and them. I'll be your co-facilitator with this um, amazing panel of folks. And um, I'm a consultant and a coach with the Groundswell Organizing Institute at um, Grassroots Organizing Institute with the Groundswell Fund. And I want to ask um, my co-facilitators to introduce themselves. I think Barb already did, but I want to welcome you to do that again, just so that we get our introductions early. Sure. So my name is Barb Cardell. I am the training director for the U.S. Positive Women's Network. And the pronouns that I use are they, them, and theirs. Hi, I'm Rika Rodriguez. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I have a lot of hats in the community, and so I'm not even going to go into all that. But thank you for having us, and thank you for being here. Great. So, um, yeah, so today is the uh, fourth in a six-part series brought to you by Positive Women's Network and the Groundswell Fund. And I'm really um, excited to see that. Uh, looks like we have 19 participants, but we probably have more. Folks are probably huddling around laptops. And um, if you're doing so, I want to encourage you to share that in the chat box. We can get a sense of everyone who's here. And um, also want to invite folks to introduce yourself in the chat box. Some folks have already been doing that. Um, we don't have, um, we really can't do traditional introductions. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free to share your name, your pronoun organization, and where you are um, plugging in from, what city you're based in. And while y'all are doing that, we're going to get started on the fourth topic. And, the, and this topic is building from the ground up, finding your people. And the session specifically is going to cover uh, these three main bullets. And I'll go ahead and read them for folks who are, are only on the phone. Um, we're going to be covering the art of first impressions and multiplication. So what does that mean? It's the art of how we find our people. How do we identify people who can, we can bring into our work? And how do we recruit them to, uh, to get engaged? Uh, the second thing we're going to talk about is contact versus outreach and um, how to build a base for community organizing. There's a lot of methods and approaches to doing outreach. We want to discern um, um, how we can um, apply those activities specifically for community organizing. Finally, we're going to talk about infrastructure. And um, how we create engagement spaces or environment, environments as leaderful containers. So 
So in our last webinar, uh, if folks joined us last week, we can just do a really quick little recap of what we talked about. Um, in our last webinar, we talked about um, stories, the importance of uh, our stories. Uh, we talked about uh, a framework um, uh, that, that has been um, um, kind of framed by Marshall Gans, who is a professor at Harvard, but is actually uh, an approach that organizers have been using for a very long time. But Marshall Gans um, put together this framework called the public narrative and how the public narrative, or in other words, sharing our personal story of how we came into doing social justice work is a practice of leadership. We talked about what makes a compelling, powerful story um, and how um, standing on a moral ground and being able to communicate uh, a choice that we've had to make in the face of a very difficult challenge or a difficult moment and, and choosing to do to take action, even in the face of uncertainty or feeling unprepared, is actually um, a, a story that's worth telling. It's a story that's, that can be used to um, uh, uh, light the passion uh, in other folks around getting involved, activating themselves, and that training people to share this story is actually part of a process in which we can build um, and consolidate uh, groups in our community to take action collectively. We talked about how this is actually the point of community organizing, is about collectivizing our action, is about um, working together and um, being able to share, have a shared analysis of what are the problems and issues facing our community. And we also talked about how um, the groundwork that needs to be done around sharing stories is actually rooted in having one-on-ones with community members, with, with our friends, with our family, with our neighbors. And um, we talked about, you know, how many one-on-ones do I need to have before I can identify and recruit someone to join us in this campaign, for example, or to become a member of my organization? Um, and we talked a little bit about that. We talked about how, you know, it takes about three or four one-on-ones before, uh, and on average. Um, and we're actually going to go a little bit deeper in that topic um, for this session. Exactly how do we find our people and bring them into our work, whether you uh, um, approach your work as a campaign, whether you and you're inviting people to be part of a campaign, or if you're thinking about uh, a bigger a bigger space, like is your organization a potential political home for folks in your community, and how can you invite them into your political home? So that's what we're going to be talking about, and um, that was just a quick recap of what we talked about two weeks ago. So we can move to the next slide. And so um, how the 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 idea is how do we move from one individual, right? One individual in our community and what does it take to move that one individual and their story, their problems, the things that they're facing um, to become part of a larger effort for community action? So how do we go from an individual with a problem towards a shared analysis and strategic action for the improvement of the collective? The way that we do that is we begin by bringing, having person-to-person -person conversations with folks in our immediate network, friends, family, coworkers, um, in our school communities, in our neighborhood, um, folks that we meet at events, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. I'm going to hand it over to, um, I think, Barb for this section. Yep, come back to me. A framework. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. So we're going to go ahead and show a series of images of different social environments. And we'd like for you to tell us in the chat box, or if you're feeling really inspired, go ahead and raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, we'd like you to tell us, one, what do you see? Two, how are folks feeling in this environment? Um, and and uh, to kind of give us a little bit of a sense of what you see and what they're feeling. Uh, so you ready? Here's the first image. What do you see and how are folks feeling in this environment?
or how maybe maybe it's also like how would folks like how do we feel when we're coming up on a door like this <laughs> it's not our door it's not yeah. where we live yeah exactly because a lot of what we do is we actually um you know are doing some door knocking doing some community outreach and so it looks like people are feeling safe safe and inviting peace um a question is this safe um anxious and so it seems like we have a a range of, of um, people feeling safe and, and some people feeling not so safe and some people having some internal um, anxiety and some challenges and, and welcomed. You know, I think that, um, you know, all of those are valid. When we go up to a door, especially a door we don't know, it can um, cause us to, to, to feel a little nervous and a little um, uncertain about what kind of reception we're going to get. And, even if somebody has a welcome mat out, um, you know, that is, is not always how we feel sometimes when we're going up to the doors. So we're going to go ahead and go to the second image. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have people who are like, you know, ready to chat, intimidated, and also the space is small, and I don't like it. Thank you, everybody, for sharing that. All right, second image is this one here. So what do you see and how are folks feeling in this environment? Busy, yeah. And so for those of you who might be watching on your phone, this is um, sort of an entryway at a conference. Um, so we've got a little bit of a food court and an escalator going on. There's a lot of people there. Yeah, crowded, anxious, a little nervous, a lot of a little nervous. Uh, and then we have people who say you're a crowd that's easy to blend in or stand out, but it's hectic. Ah, uh, I feel alone in this one, like everyone's minding their own business. Yeah, thank you. So a foyer can represent a, a guest environment in a home, but not really in a home. You know, it's close enough to the front door. And, and so when we're talking about this, you know, you can um, either feel like they're safe environments or a place where you do not know yet. And that gives you a chance to sort of assess. Um, you know, also people are sort of grouped together and are talking. And there's and, you know, a number of people that are off by themselves that either are looking like they're trying to Connect with people or maybe are um, wanting to be a little bit um, isolated. So next up we have our third image. And this is a living room. Um, so what do you see and how are folks feeling in this environment? And, and, and you know, read some body language perhaps about how the people in the picture are feeling um, or maybe how you would feel if you were in this setting. You know, if we've got a plan is coming together, a gathering, learning, communication. I'm going to go ahead and type it in the chat box. That'd be great. Focus group, trust, uh, community, feeling heard, leaning in, engaging. Yeah, I when I first saw this, noticed that there were cookies out. I'm all about the food. I'm just going to be really honest with people. Food and coffee, so they look like they've got cookies and coffee. And so it feels like this is a chance certainly um, to connect and to um, make eye contact and to deeply listen, that people are comfortable around each other. Absolutely. So living room environments are sort of medium-sized environments that are designed as places where you can have deep conversations where you can listen, where you can change people's minds, perhaps, um, and, and where you can build a taste of community, where you can feel connected, um, and you can actually have a, you know, a number of people who, who come together. So what are some living room type environments that you might have in, in your work? So we're moving a little bit from just sort of our personal experiences to our work experiences, and, you know, it could be at work uh, could be our advocacy work. Uh, for me, like I think of when I think of the the foyer environment, right, which was that big hectic looking one that you know that 
the milling around, you know, that, you know, that kind of environment is um, basically a space where people can check each other out <laughs> and kind of get a sense and a feel, maybe get information. And the living room environment is um, an environment that I would step into, like, okay, I'm ready to meet people. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> I'm ready to, to actually spend a little more time. Um, and living room environments for me that I really enjoy are, um, you know, they could just be even in a coffee shop or a park um, where it feels like there's an opportunity to get to know people. Maybe like in the foyer environment, I'm like, I don't really, it's okay if I meet one or two people. Mostly I want to check it out. But in living room environments in my work, I look forward to like, okay, who am I going to meet? Who am I going to net talk to and learn about someone and share about myself? Thanks, Lisa. And, and actually, I just want to, you know, uh, also kind of comment a little bit about what people are popping up in the chat box with, um, you know, Roxy said this to her, um, the sort of living room type of environments are her PWN chapter meetings, which I think is great because that is, when we talk about PWN not being a support group, but coming together and providing support. And I absolutely feel like, um, you know, our meetings are sitting down in my living room with uh, people that I really feel comfortable with and I really appreciate and also um, feel like we come together to do some amazing things. So thank you. And we've got um, Lisa, about, Lisa Johnson uh, Lett from Alabama saying that she makes her office space like a living room, that she has six or eight people from PWN in her office at every block party. So this is absolutely like, I hope you have cookies. Uh, Lisa, not gonna say, you know, if you don't, but just uh, hope you got cookies. Because if you do, I'm on my way. Um, and then, yeah, we have some comments about PWN work groups and online virtually we've worked really hard to have those feel like living room space as well by being able to communicate, video, see each other, um, you know, open up by asking how we're doing rather than just diving into the work. So these are great answers. Thank you so much, everybody. We're going to go ahead and go to the last image. And this is a kitchen. Um, and so what do you see and how are folks feeling in this environment? Yeah, work, he says working together. Mm. And teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> Cheryl, it looks like work to me. Yeah, yeah. Productive, like minded family. You know, so a kitchen is an environment where we allow our close friends to, to come and share space. Uh, we begin to feel more like our family. And people at the kitchen table are considered core leaders when we talk about using this um, sort of these sort of steps and these examples as our organizing um, framework. So we have people in the foyer. We've got lots of people. We're all kind of seeing where you're at, what your points are, how you're working. Living room, we sit down, we start coming up with a strategy. You move to the kitchen, and that is where you, you really kind of um, – you know, maybe take your earrings off and, and get down to some business. Um, and, and so this is, a, to me, a great representation of people coming together and, and, doing, and doing, real, doing real work at the, at the kitchen. You know, um, the small groups do develop out of these larger groups. And sort of as we kind of narrow down and develop, we also identify who is really interested in moving uh, more into leadership. And those are the people that we can continue to bring along with us, which is really important as we talk about community organizing. So I'm going to stop there and see, Lisa, is there anything else that you wanted to add about these images before we move to the next slide? And if you're adding something, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, these environments, as Bob was saying, these are, we could think of these environments one because we're so familiar with them, right? Whether it's a doorstep and we're anxious and that feels like a very individual um, activity, right? It's it's meant to look like one entry point, right? We could think about our organizations as what are the entry points that we that we set up for community to find us. 
right? Because sometimes they find us um, and sometimes we have to go out and find them. Uh, but once we get them into the door, what are the environments that we can create, right? So that folks can start to have, have a sense of belonging all the way from that for your big kind of a, um, just kind of networking space um, to these very uh, um, intimate, intensive and, and very um, uh, trust filled spaces like a kitchen, right? Where you do kind of, uh, uh, where you work together uh, in smaller groups. And so if we move to the next slide, um, so basically what we walked you all through was this, this um, pathway, right, of uh, leadership and leaderful infrastructure, right? Um, when we're doing community organizing, um, it's a, this, this um, doorstep to the kitchen analogy is a nice way to envision and develop our recruitment approaches and also um, for the, for the goal of developing uh, a leadership base, right? If we don't go out and find people, we're not gonna be able to bring people into living room environments that we create for recruitment or even kitchen, kitchen environments where we can work with people and work on strategy, work on campaigns or work on, on, on different, different things. Um, we, we, in organizing, um, we think this way because our goal is to recruit folks to become leaders. Um, and we're looking for folks who have varying commitment levels and skills. And our approaches have to be meaningful so that we can test that commitment and we can also learn more about their skill level. Um, one goal we have in organizing is to create these environments, right? So that there's a, there's a container where they can do that. Um, and then we move potential core leaders from being guests right, either in the foyer or the living room, kind of a guest into these kitchens, kitchen environments or the kitchen spaces. Um, so uh, you can also think of this as a leadership ladder, how we bring people into the work. Um, I wonder if folks have any questions. And in, well, uh, maybe invite folks to raise their hand or to um, comment in the chat box. Yeah, it looks like this has actually really been resonating with Kamari. And Kamari, I'm wondering if I can um, take you off of mute and ask you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why the power that you see in this image and how you plan to use it in your coalition building. You are off of mute if you'd like to go ahead and share with us, Kamari. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Sure can. Okay. Um, just essentially, I'm just a visual person. Like, Give me a coloring book and tell me how to figure it out. I'm super happy. So um, <laughs> listening to uh, the, you know, you explain everything and looking back on the specifically the coalition work I've done in Florida around HIV criminalization, the group was kind of already established when I came into the work. So I've really been trying to figure out how um, not to start from scratch or dismantle anything because I think the people that are involved are engaged and, and passionate and want to do the work. But I know that we're, we're missing areas of engaging other people. So the, the part that Lisa explained about creating an entry point, I really want to go back to that and kind of really assess what is, what are other entry points we can use? Cause right now all we have are monthly webinars and a Facebook page and I know we can do better and do more. And yeah, this is just super helpful and, and it was inspiring for me to dig deeper. Thanks, Maria. Thanks for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this image too because I always like to welcome people into my house, but I let very few people into my kitchen. Uh, for those of you who know, to, to be asked to be uh, come into my kitchen and help out, that is, those are people that I really lean on and depend on and trust. And so to me, this absolutely resonated. It's like, yeah, you can go sit in the living room, but the kitchen is, is where the, you know, where my, my true people. So now everybody's going to come over to my house and wait to see if they're invited into the kitchen. So I'm just going to say, all of you are invited into the kitchen for sure. Is there anybody else who wants to um, raise their hand and um, share how this is perhaps uh, resonating with them? You just go ahead and click uh, the, the, the raising your hand. You can go ahead and take you off of mute. All right. Looks like everybody is 
Good to keep moving forward then. Great. So we're actually going to get into, we're going to return to that um, imagery of the doorstep to the kitchen um, a little bit later. But now we're going to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about uh, specifically the activities for that entry point or how we find our people, right? How are we going to find people to even bring them to the door? Like I said earlier, sometimes people are looking for us and they find that door. They knock on it and they're like, let me in. I, want, I need to be part of what you're doing. I love what you're doing. Give me some work. <laughs> I want to volunteer. Um, but sometimes folks, we have to go out and find them, right? We have to um, connect with them. We need to um, demonstrate a radical, such a radical hospitality that makes people feel like they belong. There's so much, um, so, so many difficult things happening, even just in the last week right, in our country that makes folks feel isolated, that makes us all feel paralyzed. And, and we, and our part of our job as organizers, even just as community members is to find each other. So how are we gonna find each other? In our last webinar, we talked about some of the different outreach approaches that all social change approaches might consider using. And when I, when I say social change approaches, I'm talking about direct service providers. I'm talking about folks who do educational work, um, not just like K through 12 education or college education, but like community education where we're out there um, imparting information on skills or experience to, to folks in our community, self-help work, advocacy, electoral work, all the way up to organizing, right? These are all, um, social justice approaches on that spectrum, right, of empowerment. And all of them use these, um, what you see before you, um, um, these types of outreach to find people, right? We might do street outreach, we might do tabling, we might do presentations, canvassing phone calls. Um, we all use those approaches. Um, but I want to pose a question. If we move to the next slide, um, what is the best outreach approach you would use if you are community organizing? What is the best outreach approach you would use if you are community organizing? Can we go back to the last slide so folks can take a look at that? And just share your, um, your ideas in the chat box. Door to door one-on-ones, going into the community. Okay, oh, Kamaria says, I think placing myself at events and tabling, networking, mm -hmm. flyers and posters, yep, house meetings, great. Phone banking. Have a team around you and do all that you are that 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 were mentioned. Ah, okay. Presentation, social media, have food. That that always will, will attract a community. Yes, breaking bread with people is just a very human thing. That's how we start to build trust. Let's move to the next slide. And the one after that, the answer is all of the above. <laughs> All of these forms of outreach can be used um, for community organizing. So then the question is, then why isn't everybody community organizing, right? Why, why, is, why, why do we even have that distinction? Let's move to the next slide. And the answer is that um, the, a base building fact is that not all outreach is created equal, right? Um, and what I mean by that is that there are some outreach methods that will, uh, where you can, um, you can reach a lot of people on a very short amount of time, right? If you are doing a presentation and, the, and it's a 50 people in that presentation, you're talking to 50 people in like 20 minutes, right? Um, versus if you're doing door knocking, you could door knock for an hour and maybe talk to two people. <laughs> right? So in, in 
as uh, community organizers, we know that there are a lot of outreach methods. However, what organizers want to do or what we want to train others to do is to see this as contact work, right? Sometimes when we do outreach, it is um, a very light touch or a touch in a particular circumstance or moment. Maybe it's tabling, someone comes to my table, they'll get stuff. Um, and I'm, and I'm, my goal in that sense is to do outreach and to disseminate as much information as possible. Maybe I'm, I am um, canvassing and I'm leaving door hangers and whoever, you know, I'm moving from door to door. That's my goal is to disseminate that information. In organizing, we want to approach that idea of outreach more as contact work because that first time that we talk to someone is just our first contact. Um, our intention is to actually replicate that contact over and over and over and over again. And so in organizing our outreach, we, we consider it just contact work. And so we're able to do use any of these um, outreach approaches um, because they are entry points so that we can do some deeper contact work, deeper one-on-one -on -one work, and actually um, build a relationship with people over time. Um, we're looking for people, it, as, as community organizers, oftentimes what we are looking for people so that we can get to know them, assess what their skills are, get a sense about what matters to them so that we can plug them into our work. Oftentimes that work might be for a campaign, right? But, but oftentimes, I mean, and, and these times we have to build, we're building for, for, for a series of campaigns, right? Like we are the, the struggles and the fights that are being presented to us are like, we, we need to build power so that we can um, um, actually make a dent in, in the, in the in the um what is happening right now in different policy arenas or in different communities right and so it isn't uh, it's for the long haul and for a long-term kind of relationship so let's move to the next slide okay so in organizing you can we have um steps and just like if you were to do your laundry, right? <laughs> um, they, in, in, in the washing machine has a wash, has a rinse, has a spin, a, a cycle, right? And then it completes. You wouldn't ever, um, in, um, when you're doing your laundry, expect the machine to wash, jump to spin, and then, and then complete, right? You have to rinse. Um, and so in the same way in organizing, there are so a series of particular steps that we follow for our contact work, regardless of the outreach method that we used. Maybe we, we, we built a list online and people shared their phone number, right? If we're, when we're organizing, there's a, a series of steps. And if we click, we can um, see the animation for the series of steps. And I always think about it, it's like a wash and rinse cycle, right? It's the steps, you have to follow these steps. In organizing, once we make a contact with a person, once I get someone's phone number, once they're willing to meet with me, um, there are particular steps that really organizing methodology um, requires that we follow because we're building one-on-one -on -one relationships. And so that is contact work, then we follow up to meet with them. A PV here in this case is a personal visit or a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we assess someone's interests. Um, we ask them to take a small action so that we can assess their commitment. We follow up with them again and we have another personal visit or we call them and say, how did, how did you know, if we ask them to pass out some flyers, we call and we find out, did you pass out those flyers? Who did you talk to? Um, and then we do another one-on-one -on -one to, or we invite them to a meeting, right? And once we invite them to the meeting and we see that they came and they participated, we might call them again and, and ask them what they thought about the meeting. We might ask them to volunteer to, do an, to take another step to show their commitment. And so you see that much like the, you know, the wash and rinse cycles, like this like linear, this line of uh, wash, rinse, spin, complete. In organizing, when I think about it as a spiral, right? because we're actually going deeper and deeper with people 
once we make the initial contact um, and um, we know that in organizing that once we begin that process that what we are doing is investing in the potential for that person to become a leader in our organization they may already be a leader in their community we want them to become a leader in our organization and we want them to also practice this model with other people in their in their network so that they can identify and recruit people from their family and their friendship circles um, in their neighborhoods this is the cycle that we use um, in our contact work and we can use any outreach method to meet people and then we take it a step further So here we have this cute uh, Peanuts comic strip. Um, and uh, it, you know, it has uh, Lucy and uh, Charlie Brown and um, I don't know if somebody wants to read it. The folks on the phone. Basically I can read it. It's, it's um, you know, so Lucy is saying, uh, oh. so, uh-huh. I was gonna Sorry, read it for you. Go for it. Thank you. It's, so what do you think? What difference does it make? Your nerve, you never listen anyway. I was just making conversation. When you make conversation, you have to listen to. You do. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so what, what, what is that trying to do? What is that saying? That means they have a, she has questions, well, he has questions, and she's confused, it looks like. So how do you come to a common uh, conclusion of the question that's being asked? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and in Lucy's mind, right, Lucy's mind, a one-sided conversation for her is just fine. Right, right. Um, and 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 Charlie Brown saying like, wait a minute. When you're conversing, it means listen. Let the other person talk. And so um, this is just a cute kind of segue for us to get into um, the nitty gritty about how we have conversations with people in our community. We all have different styles, um, and we all have um, you know different needs. Um, everybody. Uh, um, it's, 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 it's not very often that people actually truly listen. And one of the things that um, is really emphasized in community organizing is this discipline of active listening. Um, active listening is not waiting for your turn to interject, in this, right? Or this one-sided conversation, like this little um, uh, comic is just, a, you know, really cute way kind of um, conveying you know, something that is really kind of like endemic in a lot of our interactions, whether at work or at home in our community, you know, sometimes we just need to vent and we're just like talking, 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 and then we're like, thank you. And then, we, you know, we, we, we don't really have conversations. So the art of conversations is something that organizers and folks that want to do organizing really have to work on and really have to practice. It's like a muscle that just needs to be exercised. Um, and so mm -hmm. organizers are very intentional about um, making sure that they are practicing active listening skills, and that they know how to draw people um, out and to share their stories so that they can listen deeply and close to what they're saying. Um, organizers will, you know, spend 80% of our time with, with a community member or a potential new member should be listening. They should just be listening and not trying to, you know, get sign people up for anything or trying to like, um, sell them anything. And 20% of our time should be spent, um, you know, asking them questions so they can share more, but we're going to, we're going to get into that in a minute. And so I'm going to hand it off to Rika so that she could talk to us about one-on-ones. Um, thank you. 
So um, to set as a foundation for relationship tells us what folks are facing personally and what they're passionate about. Um, it gives us enough information to assess leadership potential in our organization um, and, and it allows us to make an ask and mobilize commitments. I do this on the daily. <laughs> Usually I find that I'm always have, having to ask for um, somebody to do something. Um, so the types of one-on-ones that we have are exploratory one-on-ones. What makes them tick? Um, so we want to find out what, what's that person's desire? Why, why are they motivated to start organizing? Um, what is their story of self? Um, to share a little bit about themselves so that we can get a little bit more familiar with them. Um, discovery one-on-ones. It's um, like peeling an onion. And then we have the anatomy of um, exploratory one-on-ones. So the introduction, um, we want to make sure that we make proper introductions. We don't want to just, you know, go lightly and um, pass through our introductions. We want to use active listening. We want to focus. We want to um, use invitations to ask. Um, and here are some tips. So lead with a question, um, kind of like motivational interview, and you want to always ask questions open-ended questions and share just enough to invite them to share a little bit more. We always want to use the 80, 20 percent uh, rules where we're listening 80 percent and we're only talking 20 percent because if we're not active listening, then we're not hearing what, what's most important to those folks. Um, and we don't want to pry. We don't want to probe. Um, we want to move at, at a slow pace and we want to build, we don't want to establish trust. We also want to focus on getting to know them and not getting them to do something. Um, some people tend to shy off if you, they feel like you're pushing stuff on them, and so we want to definitely uh, not put that feeling in the way. Um, we want to explore. Uh, so we want to do what they care about, which is self-interest, um, what problems are affecting their lives, um, and their family, of course. The fam a family is the most important to people. Uh, what knowledge do they have of the neighborhood or of the community? Thank you. We also have discovery one-on-ones. Um, five categories. Number one is thinking with. Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit more or do you want to wait until I go over this? Uh, I was just going to say if in the kind of exploratory one on ones, it's like when we initially at the you know first meet someone and we want to connect with them to initiate that spiral of of uh, of relationship. Um, when um, and just to ask the folk participants um, on the call, when do when do folks um, <clears throat> feel that uh, we usually have these kind of interactions like in our everyday life, right? How often do we have an opportunity to, to meet someone new and have this kind of conversation? I'm curious. Folks want to share in the chat box or raise their hand? We've got some people who are sharing. Um, so Tana said it's very important to, oh, sorry, I lost my place. It's very important to listen. Um, we have so many comments coming in, I'm trying to find it again. Yeah. Uh, very important to listen, making sure that you get them engaged. Um, somebody said, what does active listening look like? Um, how often do we have the opportunity to meet someone new? Oh, we already asked that, sorry. Uh, Lisa said, talk less and listen more, reiterate people's feelings, and find the common denominator between relationships to build upon. Yeah. And Eve said, I usually use real life examples by posing a question. That's an awesome technique. Yes, and, and how, how, what does active listening look like? Um, I would say uh, everything that folks mentioned. Um, and asking um, personal, uh, sharing personal life examples by posing a question is um, a very artful technique because it, it, it invites people to open up and share, right? People share at different rates, which is why we do, we think of doing several one-on-ones because um, people share when they're ready. 
Great. All right. So discovery. Um, one on ones are done after the exploratory. Um, one on ones. It helps us enable um, and to help us to discover and tap into um, the already always existing leadership of an individual, and to invite them to learn into into uh, sorry, invite them to learn the struggle with us. Um, where where we do. Uh, we have these kinds of interactions in everyday life. And as I saw Lisa had mentioned, we have the opportunity to meet people every single day, and which is true. Any questions does anybody have? I'm going to read this slide because I don't think I read this one. Um, so five categories, thinking with, challenging or making an ask, task or stepping into a role, evaluation or debriefing, and reflection. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to put into the chat box? I like to think of these categories as all my, my, my kind of like my, 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 um, my permissions to call someone as I'm, mm -hmm. I'm developing a relationship with someone new, right? Um, in my personal life, I have a small circle of friends and as the people that I, you know, have had in my life for a long time. When I'm in or when I'm working and moving through the world as an organizer, um, I know that I have to be more intentional about um, building relationship with people and that that takes time. So, you know, I need to stay and, and oftentimes because folks aren't necessarily in proximity to my personal life then I, fi I find that thinking of these categories, you know, you know, I can call someone and debrief something with them. At the same time, I'm, I'm maintaining that connection. And, and when, mm -hmm. I'm, when we ask someone for their opinion or to share their experiences, we are um, validating that people are experts of their lives and they have an analysis that's worth sharing. And it feels good when someone asks us what we think. Right, because that doesn't happen too often. We're often told what to think, or we're being told what to do. Um, yeah. Someone here, Eve is saying, is it is it okay to just let them go if they're ignorant or stigmatizing? Yes, I think when we're doing um, our contact work, we are often we want to be very clear and open with people about what our values are. And we make sure that folks are aligned with us. Um, where in this in this context of this webinar, we're talking about how we find the folks who are aligned with our values and with our organization. We're going to bump into folks that aren't right. And so, at the, in, for the purposes of this webinar, we're not going to be wasting our time with people who are who have oppositional thinking or who are you know not on our side. We're looking for folks who are looking for us. And so, you know, if we bump into a person that is like a stigmatizing or difficult person, we move on. That's not the kind of person we want to bring into our organization. They might be having a, a bad day, but we're actually, we're, we're, we're looking for people to recruit. Yeah, and yes, um, building relationships by telling your story to get someone engaged is the process of using the public narrative. That's exactly what we talked about in our last webinar. Um, and, and, and knowing what our story is and getting that story down so that we can share it in a, in a powerful, passionate way is, is a great thing to practice. Um, actually, you know, write it down and practice it. So let's do a quick review. We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. And so um, we talked about the, the foyer, the doorstep to the kitchen environments as um, the, the infrastructure that as organizers, we need to create those spaces so that the folks that find us or that we find have somewhere to go, right? We're not just recruiting people and then not engaging them. We need to create spaces where they can come and engage and learn and grow and contribute. We talked about the difference between outreach versus contact work and how organizing, in organizing, we can use all the outreach methods. Um, the point is to then take it a step further and, and initiate a, a, a process of contact work where we're um, reaching out to folks, we're meeting with them, we're having um, 
person to person conversations and um, slowly engaging them into the environments that we've created for them to be involved either in the campaign or our, our organizations at large. We mapped out organizing um, contact guidelines as a method and we talked about one on ones as a practice of organizing. And the different types of one on ones that you can they can have with people because you know, when folks are when folks are new to you, we need to have um, kind of reasons to reach out to them, right? Why why are you calling me? You uh, other than to ask them to do something. Oftentimes, we want to just ask them what they think. We want to ask them to think with us, think through an agenda, to debrief a meeting that happened. Is all part of building relationship, getting to know someone, and building trust um, with folks. <clears throat> are there any questions so far about this material that we've covered? We're an hour into our call, so I just want to... Yeah, Lisa, we do have one question from Lisa johnson Lett, which is the Alabama crew. Um, so Lisa, did you want to go ahead and ask it at this point in time? You're unmuted and should be able to uh, ask your question. Looks like you are muted again. So Lisa, let's just go ahead and move along and then I'll ask her to type it in the chat box and I'll read it later on. Okay, yeah. And we, we can even have time at the end for some open forum for some questions. This is a lot of yeah. a lot of kind of material that we're covering. It and is. Absolutely. I'm, I'm gonna hand it back to Rika. Dun, dun, dun. All right, organ organization A, doorstep centered. Your organization A does direct service, but wants to adopt organizing methods because they realize collective power is necessary for long-term change. Organization A's main outreach approach is via the folks they speak to on their hotline for direct service. So I wanna invite folks to uh, share in the chat box. Um, first step is to decide that they want to be in service to community versus providing only service? Did I do that right, Lisa? Um, I actually want to ask folks to look at this first question and gotcha. give us what they think their response is. Thank you. Yeah, this, yeah. This and this is just a, this is like a, this is like the, okay, we talked about a bunch of different ideas, concepts and frameworks, methodologies. Now we're going to apply them in these scenarios. And so um, Rika, Rika did a great job reading the first scenario and we want to ask you all now um, that what you all think the answer to this question is, what you all would do in this situation if you were the if you were organization A doing direct service. Let's see what folks are saying. So the question is, what first step does organization A need to need to take in their journey towards collective empowerment and organizing? What would they need to do to get started? Identify folks on shared values, yes. Um, Wanda said, I've learned that it's better not to automatically correct someone even when what they're saying may be totally from an uninformed perspective. As we follow up in the conversation, speaking from a more aware, more educated point of view, we are planting seeds the right way of thinking. Yeah, I think that's in reference to what if you meet someone who is kind of difficult mm -hmm. or challenging. Yeah, everyone's mm -hmm. on a journey. So the okay. like first steps that we have are, you know, identifying folks on shared values, knowing your target groups, and doing training. Ah, someone said, Eve says one-on-ones. Good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Organization A has a phone list. Right? Or they people call in. People call in. So how would they get to their one on ones? What might they do? Or this question here, what engagement environments could organization A think uh, about inviting people to? Yeah. 
Kamaria says, call folks and invite them to a round table. Wanda says, hopefully they have support groups. I'd recommend taking the temperature of those they have in the room. I'd start training in the room and then start engaging. And so it begins, yes. Eve says, setting targets and then reach out. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving along to what a yeah, sample so plan would look like there. Mm -hmm. So here we have, for example, the, what a plan would look like, right? If we were um, all sitting with organization A and tried to brainstorm, like how would they start? Mm -hmm. Definitely you would, um, I, we, we would recommend, one recommendation could be, okay, you have this hotline, folks have been calling and um, let's call them back. Actually call them back <laughs> and invite them to something. Um, somebody mentioned a round table. It could be a dinner. It could be a potluck gathering. Really uh, anything that would um, change the relationship um, that folks who came to you at first to fill a need, a service, uh, some material need that they need, that they have, and um, changing the relationship to inviting them to actually be in, in different in a different relationship with the organization, not as a recipient of a service, but in in a in a community based relationship. So the plan we have here, for example, the method would be uh, calling back those folks using a warm list. Um, a warm list could be folks that called in the last month recently, right? They're warm enough versus folks that called a year ago. That's, that's kind of a long time ago, so that list may be cold, but if it's folks I called a month ago, you know, it's still fairly fresh that you gave them some support. Um, and what's the ask? In organizing, we have the ask. We want to ask people um, to show commitment or interest. In this case, the ask could be inviting people to an event. Let's call it, let's say it's that it's a potluck, right? Um, or it's a listening session where Organization A is inviting community to share something, their ideas, their, their um, a perspective on, on a certain issue that is impacting the community. Um, so the ask would be, we'd be calling people to invite them to the gathering, but we might also try to see who of those people on our list would be open to meeting with us one-on-one. -on -one to have a person-to-person -person conversation. And that person-to-person -person conversation could be just the exploratory one-on-one -on -one that we talked about earlier, where we're listening, we're finding out who they are, or finding out what, what, is, um, you know, what, what is important to them, um, and invite them and tell them a little bit about the event. And so you see here, this, is, this would be like a, a three-week plan or a four-week plan where the first three weeks would be making phone calls and seeing if people are willing to meet one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Oftentimes, we'd be, you'd be surprised that people actually are willing to meet you, <laughs> uh, meet with us in person, uh, maybe not, not a large percentage of the folks. But, um, you know, there's people, people that are hungry for connection and they, they would be very interested in connecting um, in person. Uh, then in this plan, you see that the week leading up to the event, um, those people that said yes, that they would come to the gathering or the event, we would call those people back um, in this plan and remind them, right? We ask them, do you need a ride? How would you get here? Um, and at the event, um, if this is an organizing event, we would ask folks, we would have an ask for the group. We would ask people to commit to something or to a role to us so that we could begin to assess leadership. And a week later, we would call people to thank them for coming and to follow up on that ask or to set up more one-on-ones, to set up a discovery one-on-one, -on -one, to think through something with folks or to debrief and evaluate. So that's a sample contact plan, right, for organization A scenario. We can move on to organization B now. It's a different situation here. All right, scenario B, kitchen-centered. Organization B does policy advocacy, and their core leaders know the legislative process like the back of their hands. Organization B knows that in order to keep the hard-won legislative wins, they must build a base of support. 
Their outreach bread and butter is presentations and tabling at community events. What system, what system or systems should organization B create in order to deepen their uh, contact work? What engagement environment could organization B consider designing and planning prior to bringing people in onto the doorstep? Please go ahead and share it in the chat box. Somebody shared a question here, would this work as well if they have an email list but no phone numbers? Would the timeline for warm to hot engagement be the same? Can I answer that question actually? Because it's from the previous slide. Um, it, you're right, and then someone says people here don't open their email sometimes. I'm, I'm you know, we get, we, we sign up for stuff. I'm one of those persons that signs up for a lot of different things. And sometimes like I prioritize the ones that I'm engaged. More, I'm more engaged in some, less engaged in others. Um, definitely emails, emails are like the door, is, is like the doorstep, right? It's an entry point. Our goal as organizers is always to get a phone number. <laughs> so if you send out emails, make sure that your email, you you have like a form or something that folks could like share could could give them an opportunity to share their phone number with you um these days people don't even pick up their phone anymore sometimes <laughs> you have to text them right um and then you say can i call you <laughs> and wait for them to respond to your text so i would say yes like we want to get people's phone numbers um and you know part of it is learning like what is the method of communication that folks are comfortable with there's so many ways to do it now before you only had a phone now we have messenger we have text we have signal we have all these different ways um so yes i would i would try to get people's phone numbers and the timeline for warm to hot engagement is the same um it depends um i think it depends on what you're engaging people into um, there's a lot, been a lot of comments, so I don't want us to miss the comments um, about the, yeah. phone numbers are gold. Yeah, no, it looks like a lot of the comments that we have are about phone numbers versus emails, people not opening emails, um, you know, and Lisa has talked about creating the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV, um, especially if we're not at the table, we're on the menu, for sure. And, uh, you know, and, uh, making sure that communities who are most impacted, in our case, we often are dealing with communities where um, planning is happening for people living with HIV, and there aren't any people living with HIV at the table. And so ensuring that there are, or any of the impacted communities, this, the last webinar we had the example about the um, parking and the traffic in the community and and so we would want to make sure that people in the community who are most impacted were, were there for sure yeah yeah and and in the in the previous slide the questions what what systems should an organization be which is a we call it a kitchen centered right because it's a small there's a small group of of, of their most uh, um, imp, um, their core leaders who are very who are experts at the process of what of the um, um, uh, social change approach that they use, which is policy advocacy. What systems would they create in order to deepen their contact work? Um, one thing could be um, uh, here we have for organization B. I think if they conduct a training for advocates to speak to legislators, that could engage community more. Uh, and a one-day summit that included trainings. Um, that, is, that is a great um, environment, right? If we think of that as an environment, that could be like a living room environment, right? But if you're trying to get new people in, um, you got to get them into your doorstep first. Um, and some of them might be, they might be down and ready for mm -hmm. it. Some of them maybe need that foyer in between space, right? And so um, the, one of the systems that this organization could implement um, could be a, um, you know, be, start meeting one-on-one -on -one with the folks that they have contact with on a regular basis. They could also develop a way to assess folks for leadership um, by asking them to um, make certain commitments. And um, 
definitely a training like that, if it's timed well during your legislative calendar, could be a great living room environment that could then um, engage people pretty quickly. Um, and so then we could jump to the a couple of plans of how you might, um, how an organization B might implement that, right? So if organization B does a lot of tabling or a lot of presentations, for example, this is a, a plan that the, an organization B could implement to begin to identify new people and find new people uh, or put themselves out there so that they can be found by people who actually want to uh, take action and be, become involved. So after a tabling event um, and people who sign up and you have conversations, deeper conversations with some, maybe some uh, less deeper conversations with others because, you know, mm -hmm. just depending on the environment of what the, where the tabling is happening, um, you would follow, uh, Organization B could follow up uh, with a phone call to make a personal visit or one-on-one -on -one request and begin to schedule those, right? Um, if the, 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 this, doing this contact work has to lead to someone, to somewhere. So organization B could um, plan an organizing committee or it could be a, a committee that's working on the support of a particular piece of legislation um, or whatever it is, whether it's at the state level or at the local level. They could say, okay, a month from now, we wanna have an organizing committee meeting. Let's identify some folks to come to that meeting. So we're gonna do that through our tabling. So then you would set up several one-on-ones with the aim of inviting people to this organizing committee meeting or, or, or um, campaign meeting that you're having a month from now. Um, your, first, your first kind of layer of one-on-ones would be exploratory one-on-ones because you've just met these people, right? They're, they're, they're new. You're gonna to get to know them. Your ask is gonna be, we would really, uh, you know, when you're listening and finding out how they're connected to the issue of the mm -hmm. campaign, you would use that as an opportunity to really say, hey, what you have to offer, what your, your story or how you're impacted is really, really compelling and important. Would you be part of this committee where we're trying to move this piece of legislation, for example? Um, and, you know, just kind of think about that wash rinse spin cycle it, it looks the same right it's it's the same activities but depending on the organization and the goal um it can there's so many different um combinations that you can use um so after one-on-ones personal visits you do your reminder calls especially the people that you met with in person you have your your meeting at your meeting you ask people to commit to a task or to or to a role so you can assess their leadership a week after that you would follow up and and then you continue you continue that cycle uh, if it's a piece of legislation you know it's there's a beginning and an end oftentimes if it's a legislation that was a victory and you won there's always implementation right <laughs> there's always that implementation that happens after legislation so maybe there's the committee that then that committee could change into the implementation uh group so let's move to another plan same campaign same organization a different way to do it so maybe organization B actually wants to engage their current core leaders to do the work, right? So then maybe you would first set up a training of your current leaders, a mini training on how to use tabling as a, a out, outreach and a contact method. Um, so you do a mini training on how your core leaders are going to be talking to people, um, at the tabling event, you're not just going to be sitting there handing out papers, but you're actually going to be working the crowd, right? You got to train people to do that if it doesn't come natural to them. Um, you would also call your current leaders to confirm that they're coming to your tabling event to work, right? To, to do that outreach. Um, you'd have your tabling, tabling event and then your current leaders would do the follow-up calls. They would call the new contacts. Um, give you know depending on their availability they would do the one-on-ones they would do the exploratory one-on-ones they would do the reminder calls and do the turnout for your organizing committee meeting um, and then you'd have the follow-up um, in this scenario uh, this sample outreach plan is about how to engage your current leadership to do this work right um, so that then you can scale 
um, you know, multiply the number of people with the ability to do this kind of contact work using tabling as an outreach method. So I got two plans um, and there are so many different ways to do this, but it always follows the same, you know, wash and rinse cycle, the same contact, PV, make an ask, assess commitment and um, engage people. Great. So, Dr. Rika? All right. So, why would we take the time to follow these steps? The steps are a tried and true method of identifying new potential leaders, engaging them, and retaining them. Those methods ensure that our work is promoting collective solutions and problems rather than individual solutions and building direct relationships with the folks who are most impacted. They also ensure that we are challenging people to take action with others. And by doing this, we build, uh, or we are building environments that uh, will build trust and help us to assess people's skills. Finally, organizing emphasizes the participation and the leadership of member and leader, members and leaders in order to build a base of power for people aligned with similar values and willing to take risks. We develop new relationships and assume new roles to build an organization. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so that thank you for that great wrap up, yeah. Rika. And and now we have um, time for people to comment or ask questions. I know that Lisa Johnson Lett from Alabama. We tried to get her unmuted in the middle of the conversation. Um, looks like we have her unmuted now. So Lisa, did you want to go ahead and ask a question or share? I think you had a uh, an example of something you wanted to share. Yes, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to give an example of um, a lived experience that happened just on yesterday. Um, I co-facilitate trauma-informed HIV-specific mm -hmm. care, and I was able to go to an organization that's exactly two hours away from Birmingham and just 20 minutes away from Georgia. The organization wanted to know from a peer how to implement um, advocacy and have peer involvement. This agency is policy driven. They don't have any peers at the forefront. They say they don't know how to get them involved. Yeah. So delivering the trauma-informed care piece, a piece of that talks about healing and resilience and empowerment, voice, and choice. So as a peer advocate for AIDS Alabama, I talked about the empowerment, voice, and choice. I came there with not just brochures of what we do as an agency, but I also had brochures of PW and USA for women to get involved in Opelika, Alabama. I also had my business cards talking about peer support. And I had flyers to give out of encourage and support groups and other peer support groups that we have developed and maybe they can implement it in their organization. So I told them that we wasn't a chapter yet. Um, they're gonna give us an availability date. So when we become a chapter, they're going to give us a date so PWN Alabama Voices can come down, do a lunch and learn, and speak to the Opelika women about what's going on and the benefits of being a part of Alabama Voices. I just wanted to share that. That's awesome. That is a, that is a, great, a great victory. Lisa, yeah, yeah. thank you for being there, being prepared, and um, you know, really working to ensure that um, women, women are engaged and women have an opportunity to be engaged in, in places um, for sure. So is there anybody else who would like to share a story or ask a question? There's a comment in the um, chat box from Eve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very concerned about me getting separated from my children. One is positive while the other is negative, and I just don't know what would happen in such a scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rika, can you speak a little bit to that? Um, as a mom? So I, man, that would break my heart. <laughs> um, as a mother, um, both of my children are, are negative. Um, but I couldn't even imagine being separated from, from either of my children. Um, we would definitely have your back, that's for sure. And if we would have to come to your state and help you advocate, that's what we're going to do. Um, I can't really say that it's a, a, a situation that can't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, 
laws and rules and regulations in Eve's state, but um, we sure hope that that doesn't ever happen. Yeah, and, and I think this brings up a really important point as we're talking about grassroots organizing and moving people up the leadership ladder, especially as women living with HIV, it's really important to acknowledge that um, disclosure is a spectrum and that um, we accept people uh, wherever they're at along the disclosure spectrum. And so if Eve, for you know, safety reasons for you and for your children, you feel like you can't actively engage as a woman living with HIV, um, you can always participate in a really deep and meaningful way as an ally. Um, we, we always make sure that that is a possibility and an option um, because we know that just these situations happen and that there have been instances where women have lost their children because their HIV status has become um, part of a um, custody battle. And, and so it's a very real fear and, and, and I'm sorry that you live with that because it, it, it must be so overwhelming. And, and I think it's just a good reminder for all of us that um, you know, when we say, oh, just, ha just talk about being, you know, a woman living with HIV, that that is not as easy for, um, for people who have a lot that they feel is at risk. So when we go through and, the, you know, how do you engage people, and we have the, the being able to make calls and warm leads and, and, and have spaces. Um, you know, the same thing around organizing as uh, PWN um, is the same as organizing around regional groups and, and being women living with HIV is that, Safety is really important. Um, as we talk about, you know, our trans and gender non-conforming siblings, um, their safety also is is important. And so we, you know, are always very careful about organizing in a way that um, allows people to choose where they want to be along the level of involvement. And it means that sometimes as leaders, we have to be more creative about bringing people up that ladder. So it could be that rather than um, even though you've got a great story and we would love to have you stand on the podium and tell this great story, um, that maybe instead what you do is you either write it down so somebody else can read it for you or write a letter to the editor um, or, or um, you know, put it into a slide so that if there's a community meeting that it can be brought up as points for people to consider, that it doesn't have to be you because that's this great thing. You know, we intentionally start off our webinars with We Are Family because we really truly are family. We have each other's back and we realize that, um, you know, we want to make sure that we empower people without feeling like they have to lose something so valuable as their children in being able to be engaged. And it looks like we have um, some, just some love and support in the chat box. And Lisa, I'm going to turn it back over to you if you have a last thought um, and and certainly if you would like to conclude for our webinar for today. Yeah, I guess my last thought would be that, um, I mean, and just, just this, you know, exchange and thank, thank you, Eve, for sharing, sharing that, um, that fear, that concern, the hard to live with something like that. But that is why we organize. We organize to not be alone. We organize to feel, um, uh, the support of community and we organize to then um, try to find um, those systemic or institutional barriers or um, um, systems that would do such a horrible thing as separate a family in this way, right? And we try to change them. Um, and so I love just like all the support, the outpour of support right now in the chat box for you, but you know, to and, and to also say that um, this work of organizing and finding our, each other is something that we do because um, because we, we, we know we're not alone and we have to, we have to um, uh, the, learning the skills to be able to bring people in and be in right relationship with each other, right? And to uh, uh, demonstrate um, radical hospitality and how we bring people into our work is about um, yeah, we're facing real things um, individually and a lot of us are hurting and a lot of us uh, are afraid for lots of different reasons and um, organizing is a space that where we can build the kinds of communities that we need to be a part of and where we can also make change. Um, finding our people and making it easy for our people to find us is um, a really important step 
for any organization that wants to begin to do organizing. And um, somebody mentioned uh, the, you know, to begin to see the community members as peers, as leaders, uh, um, is, is one of those first steps. And I guess that'd be my, my, final, my final comment. Yeah, thank you. Rika, did you have a last comment? Um, stand strong, ladies. Um, organizing is all we have. Um, nothing about us without us. And we have to save ourselves because nobody is coming to save us. That's so, right. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this Saturday. We really appreciate your dedication, your heartfelt stories, and your examples. Oh, my appreciate every one of you for the power that you bring into your organizing and into your daily lives. And again, um, you know, not to overstate the obvious, but we are family. So please feel free to reach out if you need us. And we will see you back here on July 24th, two weeks, which is in two weeks. Uh, and so have a great Saturday and we will see you soon. Bye. Y'all.